Good morning, Clear Branch. Man, I'm glad you guys are here this morning. It'd be really awkward doing this by myself. Um, well, thank you. It probably would be a little awkward that way. Grateful to have our folks from Pinson with us today. If you guys aren't familiar, we've been partnering with this team since 2017. Um, through ups and downs and through changes and all sorts of stuff um, to help meet their needs, not only relative to food, but in terms of other things. And so we're grateful to have you guys with us. It's always a blessing to have you here. Um, it's always interesting on the days that you guys show up because you're very clearly high school athletes and we are very clearly not. And so um, I am grateful tremendously to have you with us. Uh, we're going to have an opportunity at the end of the service uh, for you guys to get to meet them. They're going to come down front. We're going to pray over them. Um, and then you guys can come through and say hello. Um, don't make it awkward. Uh, we would love for them to have a desire to come back. So whether you're with us here uh, in the space this morning or you're joining us online, we want to welcome you. It's a blessing, as always, uh, to be in the house of the Lord together. Uh, for those of you who are here for the first time in a while, uh, we're in the middle of a series. It's all about children's church. And I'm certain that you can remember what it was like to go to children's church when you were little. You would sing songs and you'd play games. You would oftentimes have an arts and crafts kind of thing that went along with it. And you would learn a Bible story. And so we've been taking these kind of Bible stories or concepts really out of uh, this kind of children's church context and, and digging into them and looking beyond, um, trying to figure out exactly what it means for us in this point, right? We should not be content to only look at things on a superficial level as Christians, we shouldn't be content with the milk. We should desire instead the nourishment of the meat, which requires us to work a little harder in order to, to gain from it, right? And so that's what this is about. It's about engaging with God's word. It's about recognizing the breadth and the depth and the height of God's love for us poured out again and again and again, evidenced in his scripture. And so uh, this morning, if, if, if you're interested, and I hope you are, we're going to be talking about what happens in the book of Malachi. We're going to be relating that to the book of Matthew. Now, specifically, if you're familiar with what happens in Malachi, he's the last of the prophets in the Old Testament. If you were to open up your Bible and you would go to the book of, you know, like Matthew, which is the first book in the New Testament, the book immediately before that is Malachi. Now, you would think that that meant that they had some, some pretty close proximity to each other. The, really, the reality of it is that though they follow each other, Matthew follows Malachi, Malachi occurs, it was written about 430 years before Jesus came onto the scene, and we see that played out in the Gospels, right? And so for 430 years, the people of Israel kind of waited around. They'd had these proclamations throughout the prophets and the law, all things pointing towards the coming of a Messiah. And for 430 years, they waited. Now, that's patient. Let's be real. They weren't really patient. Neither are we. When someone tells us that we're going to receive something, we have this desire and expectation that it would happen just like that. But there is oftentimes purpose in the waiting. And in this instance, the people of God were intended to be studying Scripture and familiarizing themselves with the things that had been written about the Messiah with the hope and the expectation that they would know that it was Him when He showed up and changed the world. And yet, as we know so well, they missed it. Many of them had this expectation that the Messiah would be a king who would come in on horseback, who would destroy uh, the Roman Empire, which was ruling over uh, Israel at that point. And instead, he comes in as a humble servant on the back of a donkey. He changes everything about their expectation about what a king would look like. And so it's with that in mind that we're going to back up into Malachi 4, 1 through 6 this morning for the primary scripture that we'll utilize. So join me in standing for the reading of God's holy and precious word. For behold, the day is coming, burning like an oven, when all the arrogant and all evildoers will be stubble. The day that is coming shall set them ablaze, says the Lord of hosts, so that it will leave them neither root nor branch. But for you who fear my name, the sun of righteousness shall rise with healing in its wings. You shall go out leaping like calves from the stall, and you shall tread down the wicked. For they will be ashes under the soles of your feet on the day when I act, says the Lord of hosts. Remember the law of my servant Moses, the statutes and rules that I commanded him at Horeb for all Israel. 
Behold, I will send you Elijah, the prophet, before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. And he will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the land with a degree of utter destruction. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. So these words marking the end of the Old Testament, precursor to the New Testament, oftentimes called 400 years of darkness, that in-between time, when Scripture has stopped being breathed out. There are no more prophets. They are intended to look at what's already been said. They're intended to study and to learn from God's Word, which has been given to them throughout the millennia. They've been warned again and again by prophets regarding their faithlessness and their need for submission to God. So at the time of the writing of Malachi, again, 430 B.C., the Jews had come back from Babylonian captivity where they had spent 70 years. Uh, They'd come back and they'd rebuilt the temple. The, the, The priestly order was back in place, even though they were still being overseen by the Medo persian Empire. Everything on the outside looked the part. The line of Aaron had been restored. The Jews had given up their worship of idols. Nevertheless, Malachi warns them. And he tells them that they have to stop the things that they are doing that are wrong. Specifically, specifically Malachi speaks about mistreating their wives and marrying pagans and not tithing. He talks about how the priests were neglecting the temple and not teaching the people the ways of God. In short, he calls the Jewish people to get back into alignment in honoring God, not merely in appearance, but at their very core. When I read these words, it makes me think a lot about what it must have been like as Jesus challenges the people of Israel in his time not to be whitewashed tombs. Beautiful on the outside, but full of death and decay. Far too many times as Christians, we're content to look the part without being the people. And Malachi was challenging the Jews to be the people that they were called and created to be. And I think this message as a result is still relevant for us to stay. That we should not have a superficial faith or something that's rooted in our own comfort and our own desires, but instead in a desire for us to live lives that are evidence of who God is, to point to Him in everything that we do and everything that we say. And I'm willing to bet that if you're truly honest about where you are in life, there are probably days when you look a lot less like Jesus and a lot more like you. You're not alone in that struggle But at the same time, we should be struggling against that tendency. Fighting to honor God in the fullness of who we are. But also willingly submitting to God so that his will and his word and his way can be done in our lives. That's what this is all about. people of Israel had experienced an enormous number of things. They had faced opposition and oppression, persecution. They had been exiled. And even in the midst of those things and seeing God's work poured out on them again and again, over the years they'd become blinded and deafened to the power and truth of God's word. And so when Malachi writes these words, he's not merely writing them without a hope and an expectation. He's writing them because he has hope and expectation. That the creator of all things would bring to fruition messianic prophecy, redemption, the giving of righteousness in and through the person of Jesus Christ. And so when we encounter these verses, and today we're going to kind of work these backwards, right? We're going to begin with John the Baptist because that's the way it works in the New Testament. John the Baptist comes onto the scene and he begins to proclaim as though this voice in the wilderness, eating locust and honey and wearing camel's hair, and, and, and people were like, what is with this guy? 
If you've watched The Chosen, you know what I'm talking about. His beard and hair made mine look tame. And he's there in the midst of the wilderness proclaiming the good news and baptizing with water, but, but telling them that there would be one who comes after him of whom he's not worthy of, of like touching his sandals, who will baptize them in spirit. And John begins to proclaim. And it is not superficial. It is not merely whitewashed tomb. It is a life dedicated and submitted to God's call in the fullest of ways. And so Malachi speaks to this in verses 5 and 6, saying, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes, and we will turn, he will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the land with a decree of utter destruction. When we read this, and, and when they read this, they thought, Oh my goodness, God is going to resurrect Elijah. We're going to have this like comeback of Elijah. He's going to stand before us. He's going to proclaim these things. We're going to have to be like, we'd be dumb not to recognize that this is happening. Note to self, John was Elijah in spirit, not person. And though that seems obvious to us, I think we all know what happened with John. If you watch this week's Chosen with us, you know what happened to John. He was beheaded. Because he called people into the faithfulness of the law to follow what it was that God was intended to do. To live faithfully and submissively to the God who made us. And when you tell people that they need to live in ways that do not merely honor their own fleshy desires, sometimes it makes them mad. When you challenge people to place God above themselves, Sometimes the results are dangerous. And yet that is what John did. And it's what Malachi recognized that he would do. He would come onto the scene proclaiming the name of the Lord in the wilderness and that he would institute baptism by water and that he would be a precursor to what it was that Jesus would do. And in the scripture, it's broken out like kind of in two ways. There's two things that he's expecting to happen, that there would be this repentance, this change, the turning of the heart of father to child and child to father, that that would be evidence of this new wind of, of righteousness and of rightness, which is what righteousness means, that comes from God and reshapes the nature of how we act or how they acted at this point in time. Note to self, we act that way a lot too. We probably need to be reordered and repentant. And so that's what he calls them to. Repentance and preparation for the coming of Christ the Messiah in order to protect people from destruction of that which is dedicated to the Lord. We see this, this notion of destruction. It happens you know, with, with Achan in the Old Testament as he takes things when they destroy Jericho. We see it happen in the midst of, of this scripture. There's this proclamation, this destruction. We read it as destruction, but the reality of it is it means that we're set apart, that it's made holy, that it is God and God alone who owns these things and who has a right to do with them what he wants. And so we see this notion of destruction. It's really less about destruction and more about being committed to uses as God sees fit. As God's, God sees fit. I'll get that right. And I wonder, are we committing ourselves to be used by God in whatever way he desires to use us? Are we making room and allowing God to take possession of and to be responsible for and to guide and establish what it is that we do with our time and our talents, with our gifts, with our service, with our witness? Are we far more interested in holding on to doing what we want to do and only what we want? Question for you guys. You can answer this one. You show up to football and you do what you want to do instead of what coach wants you to do. What happens? Not good stuff, right? Not good stuff. Lots of running. I remember bear crawls being an integral part of my punishment when I was a football player. Misery is what happens. And in many ways, 
That's what we see happen in Scripture again and again, is that when we lose sight of what it means to be faithful, when we lose sight of what it means to be dedicated to the Lord, and we instead decide to live for ourselves at the result, or that we wind up in places of misery, and captivity, and oppression, and brokenness. Malachi knew this, and he was striving in this time to warn the people of Israel to be aware of it too, but also to have faith and hope that God was sending something new among them that would change everything. And though it begins with John the Baptist, it does not stop there. Because though John was meant to point to the coming Messiah and to challenge people to return to this right relationship with God, the only one who could bring that to fruition was Jesus. And so Malachi changes his focus to some degree in in verse 4. He says, remember the law of my servant Moses, the statutes and rules that I commanded him at Horeb. Now, if you're keeping tabs, we've already seen a reference to Elijah, which is representative of the prophets. Now we're seeing a reference to Moses, which is representative of the law. And he is proclaiming that not only does John do this thing in a superficial sense, but that Jesus will come and be the fulfillment of the law and the prophets. That everything that's been written, thousands of years worth of text, hundreds of prophecies are going to be brought to fruition and lived out in a way that's undeniable in the person of Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God. That's what happens. Malachi is foreshadowing Jesus. And he's using people that the people of Israel would have been very, very familiar with. Moses and Elijah. See, Jesus is that word that is spoken in creation. He is the one through whom God speaks and creates. He's the word that's referenced in John 1. He's the word that's given to Moses as the means of directing and protecting the people. He's the word of the prophets, which were meant to bring them back into faithfulness and to redirect their path when it went astray. And so we read this about the law and the prophet, the immediate place as I was preparing for this that my mind went was Matthew 5, 17 to 20. You might recognize that Matthew 5 is part of the Sermon on the Mount. He teaches and proclaims these things to people of all, of all types. And he says this, do not think that I've come to abolish the law or the prophets. I've not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not one iota, not one dot will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Tough words especially if you're a scribe or a Pharisee. And Jesus understood what it was that he was saying. It was not by accident that he calls these people out and he challenges them to faithfulness again. Faithfulness, it's not merely what it looks like to be a Christian, but to be embodying what it means to be like Christ. It's not just about outward appearance. It's about the heart that's inside. I could show up at Penson on Monday, and I bet you that Coach would allow me to put on a a uniform. And he might warn me in the process, they're going to kill you. Because I might look the part, but the minute I step on the football field, they're going to recognize real, real fast that I might look it, but I'm not it. And every single day of our lives, we choose to put on what we put on, to look the part. But if we don't do the things that allow us to be the person, then looking doesn't matter at all. The way we appear falls short of what we are on the inside. If you don't go to practice, you can't do it. If you don't lift weights, you're not going to be strong enough. If you don't know the plays, you're never going to be effective. All of those things are the same for us in our own context. 
We cannot merely look it. We have to be it. I think that's what both Malachi and Jesus in the book of Matthew were challenging us to do. To live in to God's word, to allow it to shape us and to form us. And to be more real than those who may know the law up here but never apply it down here. We cannot be superficial in our faith any more than these young men can be superficial in their practice and in their play. And ultimately, though we might convince the world far too frequently that we are something that we are not, we must remember that Jesus is our Redeemer, is also our righteous judge. That he knows our hearts, that he knows the things that we wrestle with, our struggles and our failures, that he knows the places that we need to be reordering our lives. And Malachi proclaims this in the first three verses of chapter 4. He says, for behold, the day is coming, burning like an oven, when all of the arrogant and the evildoers will be stubble. The day that is coming shall set them ablaze, says the Lord of hosts, so that it will leave them neither root nor branch. But for you who fear my name, the sun of righteousness shall rise with healing in its wings. You shall go out leaping like calves from the stall, and you shall tread down the wicked, for they will be ashes under the soles of your feet. And on the day when I act, says the Lord of hosts. We may look the part, but we will never convince our great God that we are anything other than what he knows us to be. And that is sinful people in need of a Savior. No matter how much we may dress up, no matter how much we may strive to appear to be holy, if we are not holy, we will not confuse God on that fact. And within so many churches, there's this tendency to acknowledge and to proclaim the redemptive work of Christ while ignoring his responsibility for judgment. As we were prepping for this week, we do planning on Monday, 1 o'clock. You ever have a desire to pray for us on, on Monday at 1 o'clock? You're praying over our time of preparation each week. And Micah and I were wrestling with like, how do you finish up a sermon that's about like the redemptive and powerful work that Christ is, is doing, but also recognizing the judgment side. Note to self, most modern Christian songs do not address the concept of God's judgment. I think it's a shortfall. Subsequently, I challenged him to write one. It did not happen this week. That's a tough thing to do acknowledging that one day we will be held accountable for our words and our actions, for our willingness to submit to God or not, is a tough thing to talk about. And yet, it's what Malachi is reminding people of in this moment, and it's something that we need to be reminded of in this moment as well. That there is a duality in the role of Jesus, that he is not merely Savior, but also Judge. That it points to his judgment on behalf of the people of Israel because they have fallen away from what they've been called to. But it also points to the judgment that he will hold over us one day. Remember that he knows our hearts. That no matter how much we may look the part, if we are not the person, we will not confuse him. That we cannot be faithless that we cannot reject what it is that God has created us for and that he calls us to. That we're intended to proclaim and to live and to do everything in our lives in a way that points towards our God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. In verse 2, there's a speaking of a reward for the righteous after this time of pointing to this this reality of judgment. The proclamation is that those who fear the name of the Lord, having proper position 
submitting to His Word and His will and His way, can expect to experience freedom. Can expect to experience goodness. Can expect to be conquerors along with Christ. And in spite of the fact that we live in a world that way too frequently evidences that the wicked prosper, that those who are out for themselves often step on those who are living lives that are faithful to God. We know that righteousness is greater than any earthly reward. And so I wonder this day, are you placing your faith in what you're capable of? Or are you placing your faith in what only God is capable of? Are you willing to look the part and not really be it? And if you are the part, are you calling out like a voice in the wilderness as John was? Proclaiming the good news. Honoring God. And preparing the way for the coming of the Lord. Because that's what our faith is all about. And the coming of Christ is the beginning of the fulfillment of God's redemptive plan. It's proclaimed throughout the scriptures, but man, it gets flesh and blood when Jesus walks among us. And we should be different as a result of that. May we be different. May we be authentic. May we be faithful. May we be honoring of God. And may we proclaim his goodness from the mountains and the valleys of our life. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for your love. We thank you for your redemptive work. We thank you for Jesus, who is not merely our redeemer, but also our judge. And Father, we thank you that you challenge us through your word to not just look the part, but to be the person. Father, I just ask that you would refine us, that you would chip away the parts of us that don't serve your purpose. And instead, that you would help us to be more and more and more like Jesus. You give us him as this perfect example, and sometimes I think that we talk about it so much, yet we don't always catch exactly what that's about. It's about Jesus setting the tone for how we talk, for how we act, for the way that we treat others, for the lives that we live. Not in some superficial way, but in a deep, life-changing, transformative way. May we be a people transformed and a people that honor you in the midst of every part of our lives. The days that we feel like we've got it all figured out and the days that it feels like it's all falling apart. May we honor you in this always. In Christ's name, amen. Just